The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Okay, I've uh, laid out the the bad news, I guess, in the first uh, lecture. Uh, There's further bad news now, which I hinted at at the start of the, the first lecture, and that is that there is no single answer to the problems that we face because the problems are not monocausal. It is not that there is a single issue or problem that has led to the problems we face. I think, hopefully, as I, as I laid it out in the first lecture, uh, there is a, a complex of reasons as to why we've got to where we are. I've just forgotten, actually. I meant to announce the winner of the, the mug competition. Uh, Margaret Davis, if you see me afterwards, I have a free mug for you, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, you may notice I had to take my uh, name tag off as well. I was told that it was uh, shining into the cameras. Um, how they cope with my head, I have no idea <laughs> whatsoever. But anyway, uh, I, uh, I assume they can filter that out or airbrush hair on or something. But anyway, to go back to the, the topic in hand. There is no single solution because there is no single cause. We live in very complicated times. We also live at times that are very unstable. One thing that I did not refer to earlier, I'm going to touch on it a little bit tonight in my speech at the banquet, is what sociologists call social acceleration, which is the way things are constantly changing for us today. Uh, Had you been born at the time of the Reformation, you'd have been born at a time where Europe was about to be plunged into 150 years of bloody conflict as European society attempted to come to terms with the technological development of the printing press. The printing press, you can't reduce the Reformation to the printing press, but the printing press changed everything. And it took 150 years for European society to uh, assimilate the printing press, to reconstitute itself around the world that the printing press created. We live in a world now where technological developments come one on the heels of another, where it has not been possible for us to assimilate the impact of one before another hits the shore. That too is a very destabilizing thing. And that fuels the feeling that so many of us have that the world is constantly running away from us. And to quote, uh, again, to quote Karl Marx, I think for the second time today, all that is solid constantly appears to be melting into air. So we live in tumultuous times. We live in times where it is difficult to get a handle on the problem or the many problems in order to offer a stable solution. So what I'm going to offer in this lecture is just a series of thoughts uh, to sow seeds in your mind about the kind of things that we should be doing. There is a sense in which, of course, the answer is always the gospel. There is a sense in which the proclamation of the gospel, the administration of the sacraments, The Sunday worship service, and I will touch on these later, remain the answer to the world's problems. And yet we all know that the problems impinge upon us in a way that if there are things that we can modify, if there are ways that we can think that will help us address the problems, particularly as they pinch on our own personal lives, that too would be a useful thing. Again, I will speak about it a little tonight, but... As I've crisscrossed the country this last year, time and again I've had parents, grandparents, sisters, brothers, sons, daughters tell me their agonizing stories of how the sexual revolution has destroyed their family and have asked me, where is hope? And I constantly say, of course, the hope is in the Lamb, the victory of the Lamb. And yet it strikes me that as true as that is, sometimes it can be a very glib answer to the immediate problems that people face. Uh, when somebody is dying of cancer, simply to tell them that everything happens within the compass of the Lord's will is not necessarily the most comforting thing one can say, even though it might be true. We need to think of other strategies, short-term, medium-term, that make sure that that gospel we believe and proclaim is passed on faithfully from generation to generation. So, 
a number of things that I would suggest we think about as we look at the world around us. And the first is this. I think we need to understand our complicity in what has gone on. It is interesting that this rise of selfhood that I noted, this increasing emphasis uh, placed upon the authority of, of inner feelings, occurs at a time in history where everybody, even those within the church, starts to probe inner feelings. It is not a coincidence, I don't think, that while Jean-Jacques Rousseau is writing his very influential uh, first and second discourses, social contract, Emile, when he's writing the great works that constitute his corpus, Jonathan Edwards is writing the religious affections. Uh, the church never stands aside or completely apart from the general cultural questions that are being thrown up. And I think we need to understand that we live in a world where we are complicit in some of the issues that arise. And sometimes we're complicit in a way because goods we enjoy also bring with them specific problems. I talked a lot about the problem of technology, but I do not want to live in an earlier era. I'm very comfortable in some ways living in an era where, yes, I can call my mum at the weekend and hear her voice, even if I can't get to see her in person. I'm glad that I live in an era of telephones. I still have a landline, by the way. Somebody asked me, you know, why do you have a landline? I said, well, how else could I be hassled by cold callers? You know, you have to have a landline for that kind of thing. I enjoy living in a world where there are analgesics. I don't relish the thought of having a tooth extracted without antibiotics and painkillers. Technology brings a lot of good. It carries with it a risk of the dark side, as I talked about in the first lecture. Well, freedom of religion. I'm a big believer in freedom of religion. But it's worth reflecting on the risks that brings with it. Uh, when Tocqueville uh, is writing his great democracy in America, one of the things, of course, that grips his imagination, that fascinates him, is that America has freedom of religion in a way that was, at that point, pretty much unknown in Europe. And freedom of religion is a good thing. I do not wish to live in a country where I'm forced to go to a particular church by the government, or I can only go to church under threat from the government, or where the government controls the religion. I do not want to live in that kind of society. I want to live in a world where the First Amendment holds sway. But freedom of religion changed religion and not entirely in a good way. In a world where you have freedom of religion, power shifts towards congregants. When I was pastor in Philadelphia, we uh, unfortunately had to excommunicate three people during my time in Philadelphia for, for serious, unrepented of sin. Uh, all three of those people are now worshipping at other churches. One of them is a member in good standing of a sister denomination that is meant to respect the discipline of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. That's the flip side of religious freedom. What religious freedom does is it tilts all Christians towards thinking of themselves as consumers of religion. That lies at the heart of modern selfhood. If you've ever left a church because you didn't like the minister's tie or the fact that he didn't wear a tie or the fact that he did wear a tie, then you're a consumer. You behaved as a religious consumer. And that's not to say there may not be good reasons for leaving churches. There may. But the bottom line is, leaving churches is a very casual thing for us today, often predicated on whether the church meets our felt needs. And I would also add, you know, sometimes, well, your know, people are always looking for, say, contemporary worship. I would say, it's quite possible to be a traditional consumer. Maybe traditional stuff is the stuff that floats your boat, scratches your itch. 
we can all be tempted to find the church made in our image and to decide that's the true and the faithful one. We need to understand that the consumer mentality that is part and parcel of that larger LGBTQ problem that I pointed to in Lecture 1 is alive and well in the conservative religious community. Philip Reef, one of my heroes, who's an interesting uh, Freud scholar, and he didn't believe in God. He was a secular Jew. He didn't believe in God, but he thought believing in God was a good idea. It's sort of fat. I can never quite get my head around that. But he has a memorable phrase about the church. He says, in the Middle Ages, nobody went to the church to be made to feel happy. They went to church to have their misery explained to them. Glad to say the OPC take that very seriously. <laughs> uh, we will not only explain your misery, we will deepen it for you in godly ways. But it's, it's an interesting observation, isn't it? It's an interesting observation. Of course, there was no choice then. And Reef has, uh, but it's Charles Taylor makes the point that you can believe the same way as somebody in an earlier generation did. You can believe the same thing, but today we don't believe in the same way. Because Christians in an earlier age had no choice. Today we have a choice of which church we go to. Belief functions differently for us. So the first thing I would want to say is we need to realize that the church itself may actually be an expressivist kind of culture. And that is no respecter of doctrinal commitments because it's an attitude of mind and a way of imagining the church. The marketplace of religion that freedom of religion enables, which is a good thing, has a disruptive and subversive side to it of which we need to be aware. I might also point to other things. I remember in 2015 being very persuaded by the book by Sheriff Gurgis, Ryan Anderson and Robert George, What is Marriage?, being very persuaded by that book that the logic of gay marriage is essentially the logic of no-fault divorce. That gay marriage is predicated on the idea that marriage is a two-person union designed for the happiness of the people contracting therein. And therefore that logic was established in California in 1970 when Ronald Reagan signed no-fault divorce into law. Not in 2015 when the Supreme Court found gay marriage in the Constitution. How many churches have taken no-fault divorce seriously? If your church has not taken no-fault divorce seriously, then I'm inclined to say that if you worry about gay marriage, that looks a bit like homophobia from the outside. Because the logic is the same. Why would you accept it in one situation and not in another? Now, taking a stand on these things is going to be painful and hard. But if we're really going to be consistent on this, we have to take those stands. And that, I think, leads to, I would say, necessity of humility in how we address these things. We live in very polarized times. A friend of mine was telling me about an election poster he'd seen, uh, I think it was the last election, for one of the, uh, uh, I think it was a local uh, borough somewhere down south, and the poster was, vote for X. One of us, not one of them. Powerful message, I thought. Didn't tell you which party he belonged to. But indicated the polarized times. We live in the temptation in polarized times is to become very self-righteous about one's own position. I think it behooves the church, first and foremost, to be humble and to engage in a degree of heart-searching self-criticism and repentance before it chooses to lecture the world on the way the world behaves. So the first part of the strategy, I think, is this. Understand our own complicity in the sinful nature of what is going on around us and repent of it. I think that's an important thing for all Christians to do, individually and, if necessary, corporately. Secondly, learn from church history. Typically, of course, Protestants, we go to the Reformation. 
Reformation is where we go to learn the great lessons of the faith. Our heroes, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, etc., etc., the, the giants of the 16th century, and then the Westminster Assembly, the Synod of Dort, the giants of the 17th century. Learning from history is a good thing. As long as you don't idolize it, of course, we need to remember uh, the best of men, a man at best, that the 16th and 17th century were no picnics, that there was a lot of pragmatism in the 16th and 17th century, a lot of things that should have been done that weren't done. I want to suggest, though, that the 16th century and the 17th century are not the closest analogies to what we face today. In the 16th and 17th centuries, you had for want of a better term, dominant Christian culture. You had a debate going on within a culture that was predominantly Christian. And I'm using Christian in the broad sense there. But Christianity in the broadest sense was plausible. That other options were not regarded as plausible. That there was a broad consensus on the basic terms of engagement within civil society rooted somewhat in the Bible. Everybody thought adultery was wrong, for example, would be one of them. That is not the world we live in today. We do not live in a period that is analogous to the 16th or 17th century. The 16th and 17th centuries are therefore of somewhat limited use when we reflect upon strategies of how to address what's going on in wider society at this point. A closer analogy... A closer analogy, I believe, is the second century, that of the post-apostolic church. Why do I say that? Well, there are some obvious differences. First of all, I want to acknowledge that that's the thing about analogies. They're not identities. There are always differences. The big difference between today and the second century church is the second century church was operating in a culture that had never known Christianity. So there's a big difference there. Having said that, the church was operating in a culture where the logic of that engagement does present certain potent similarities with the logic of the engagement today. Think about it. If you read the uh, Greek apologists, uh, they're constantly uh, having to address issues of being you know, accused of practicing incest, accused of political sedition accused of cannibalism. Well, you can imagine in the second century, you're not a Christian, but you have Christian neighbors and uh, man and wife, they're living together, but they talk, they talk about each other being brother and sister. It would look weird to you. It would sound weird. They talk about meeting to eat and drink the body and blood of their God, who is a man. That sounds like cannibalism. And if you ask them who Jesus is, and they tell you Jesus is Lord, that sounds like a derogation from the authority of Caesar. It sounds seditious. Notice that each of those primary objections, we might say, are moral in nature. The reason why Christianity is persecuted by and large in the early church, and you know, contrary to popular myth, of course, there is no major widespread comprehensive persecution of the church, until the third century. There were sporadic local persecutions, but the big persecutions come in the third century. And persecution, by and large, was not predicated on the fact that somebody objected to Christians believing in the resurrection or believing in the incarnation. Generally, persecution happened when a way of life was threatened. We have an example uh, from the early 2nd century, the governor of Pontus Bithynia, along the Black Sea, uh, Pliny, sends a letter to the Emperor Trajan. It's a fascinating letter. Uh, it's very literarily interesting, but he's uncovered a group of Christians in his territory, and he's telling Trajan what he's done there. And it's very interesting that there have been anonymous accusations made against these Christians. And then at the end, he makes just this throwaway comment. And I was, was an undergrad, I did classics, and my history supervisor was a, a Marxist and always said, if you want to know the secret of history, follow the money. You have to be a Marxist, there's a lot of truth in that. At the end of this letter, Pliny makes a comment that since he's broken up this church, the trade 
in sacrifices for the local pagan temples is picked back up. And I teach this as part of the historical methods course at Grove when I teach it. And I ask the students, okay, based on Pliny's letter, who do you think the anonymous informants were? Who do you think? Can't prove it, but if I was a detective, you know, the persons of interest, I think, top of the list, would be the people who made their money out of selling animals for sacrifice at the local pagan temples. That's the kind of thing that was causing persecution in the early church. It was not an intellectual thing. It was a persecution based upon threats to ways of life or sedition towards Caesar. The real problem in the third century is having to sacrifice to Caesar as a sign of civic loyalty. Now, using sort of, again, slightly, well, common, common, but I'm going to use this terminology in a slightly odd way. It's an issue of recognition. Societies have ways of recognizing people. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a common sense way, like, like the term self, where one could use recognition. Todd Pruitt walks in this morning, I recognize him. Oh, no, it's that guy. I try to turn around and hide, but he recognizes me. He wants a bit of the magic. He comes over <laughs> to talk to me. Recognition in that sort of, oh, I, I see the person's face and I know who they are. There's also a sense of recognition where recognition is to do with giving somebody legitimacy and value. Societies have frameworks for recognition which refers to how they regard somebody, we might say, to be a member in good standing of society, how they recognize that person as a member of good standing or a sitting standing outside the limits. Don't want to get into vaccine issues on one side or the other, but the debates about vaccines have been a fascinating example of this. Vaccination status has become something of a term of recognition within society whether somebody is a legitimate person within that society or an illegitimate. In the second century, we might say, society has a set of terms of recognition. And Christianity gets into trouble when it runs up against them and will not conform to them. When it's thought to be a cannibalistic cult. When it's thought to be an incestuous cult. Most seriously, I think, in terms of the history of the church, when it is seen to be behaving seditiously relative to loyalty to Caesar. The issue we face today, I think, in the West, is that the terms of recognition in society are changing. And they are changing dramatically in a way unprecedented for hundreds of years. It's not that for hundreds of years everybody's been a Christian and suddenly nobody is a Christian anymore or in a dramatic minority. The situation is this, for hundreds of years, the terms of recognition have been compatible with consistent Christian faith. Now the terms of recognition are increasingly becoming incompatible with Christian faith. That's why, for example, dissenting from the consensus view on gender or marriage gets you into trouble. Because... Private views on marriage are now being raised to the level of public terms of recognition within society. So that's why I say we need to go to the second century. Because the second century might be the last time in the West where the church, in a position of abject social and cultural weakness, faced a world where the terms of recognition were antithetical the terms of recognition for membership in society were antithetical to the terms of recognition for membership within the church. That's why, hey, 100 years ago, society did not affirm the resurrection, but that didn't matter. Belief in the resurrection was not a condition of membership or non-membership of the church. Affirming certain sexual codes now is becoming a term of recognition within society. So what I want to say is if we go back 
to the second century, are the lessons then we can learn from when the church faced this kind of problem of recognition before? Well, I think there are a number of them. First of all, when you look at early second century texts, it's clear that community is central to church life. There is a code of behavior that is expected from Christians. The Didache, uh, texts from late first or early second century, sometimes called the Teaching of the Twelve, uh, may actually have been written even before the last, the latest text of the New Testament. Who knows? We don't know exactly when it was written. Very, very early. Central to the Didache are a set of moral prescriptions that shape the community of the church. It was very, very practical and down to earth. Now, one of the things I think that shapes who we think we are are the communities in which we operate. And by and large, you know, we all have, to use the jargon, we all have various identities. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm an employee. I like watching rugby. You know, there are a whole sort of things by which you could ask me, who are you, and I could give you a long list. But there's a hierarchy there. There's a hierarchy there. If I could never see another rugby game, I'd be disappointed, but it wouldn't fundamentally change my life. I've changed employment numerous times over the years. I'm an employee, and I'm committed each time to my employer, but I'm not as committed to my employer as I am to my wife and children. The different communities to which I belong provide me with my different identities or the different facets of who I am. What's interesting, of course, is that the strongest sense of self comes from the strongest communities. It's because my bond with my wife is so strong that my identity is far more wrapped up with her than it is with my employer. If, perish the thought, my wife left me or died, it would be far more devastating to me than my employer going bankrupt. That would hurt, but I could find another employer. If that's the case, then things like the Didache make perfect sense. And indeed, the letters of Paul with their emphasis upon, we might say, community codes of behavior. They shape who we are. Ironically, the LGBTQ plus community can give us a lesson in this. We don't have time to talk about it in the first lecture. One of the things I would say is we live through a time where Old forms of community are fading away. Old forms of belonging are disappearing, but people still want to belong. And when old forms of belonging, the nation, the family, the church, get weak, and people still want to belong, new, stronger communities move in to fill the vacuum. One of my striking things about Rosaria Butterfield's testimony is what a strong picture she gives of the LGBTQ community to which she once belonged. And when she left that community, she expected to find just a stronger community in the church. And she didn't find it. If, if we're going to keep hold of our young people, and some of the older people as well, strong community is important, particularly in a time when the terms of recognition in society are turning dramatically against us. And I would say there's hope here. Why do I say there's hope here? I'm a historian. When you look at the history of marginal communities, they become very strong over time, precisely because they are marginal. Max Weber, of course, famously argued for the, uh, you know, the Protestant work ethic. I wonder if Weber's notion of the Protestant work ethic is overstated. That what actually led to the dramatic rise of capitalism, for example, in Britain in the 19th century, was not the Protestant ethic. It was not the fact that these people were Protestants. It was the fact they were nonconformists. The fact that they were not able to be part of the center of the culture. 
Think about it, the great names of Birmingham industry in the 19th century. Many of the families involved were Quakers. Why Quakers? Well, they couldn't be teachers at universities. They couldn't be MPs. They couldn't serve in the civil service. You, know, you had to be an Anglican to do all of these things. So what did you do? You made stuff. You worked hard and made stuff. And they were able to do that because they'd looked after each other for centuries. They'd watched each other's backs for centuries. Marginal communities make strong communities. My wife and I had the great, very great delight last year of our oldest son getting married. And it was a time of COVID. And I have never felt so much like an immigrant as I did at my son's wedding because we had nobody, nobody from back home there. And suddenly you realize, wow, it really is just my wife, myself, and my two sons. It's just the four of us. And it became clear to me why we'd become such a tight-knit family over the years. We had to. We had to. There's nobody else. We, we got friends. But we all know that ultimately, blood is strong. And the only people you can ultimately rely on, my dad would say, are your family. We're a marginal... My wife and I, we're a marginal community. Isn't that a weird way of putting it? But our strength lies in the fact that, yes, it's just us. And that's why I would say, that's what the second century does. The church becomes a strong and powerful community. It looks after its own. It cares for its own. It would be a tragedy if we spend all of our time at the moment lamenting what's going on in society. Lamentation is appropriate. The Bible is full of it. The Psalms are full of lament. But it would be a tragedy if that's all we do. Lament can very quickly become a form of narcissism. The fact that we're small, marginalized, etc., etc., means we've, we, we've got to be onto the truth. It's a sign of how great we are. The OPC, we're good at that. We're so small. We, I remember when my congregation in Philadelphia, for a while we had over 100 people. And I think it was my good friend, Todd Pruitt, asked me, so which doctrine are you soft-pedaling on? <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Smallness is not in itself a virtue. But it would be a tragedy if all we do at the present time is lament. Marginalization might actually be an opportunity. An opportunity for precisely the kind of community building that made the church strong in the early centuries. Secondly, I think we need to teach the whole counsel of God. You might say, well, that seems rather obvious. Well, the truth sometimes is rather obvious. Sometimes it's helpful to repeat it. The danger in our current times is to panic. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight in my speech at the banquet. The danger is to panic and to let go of the basics. One of the things we need to do is teach the whole counsel of God. I made the comment that I'm relatively confident that uh, sexual desire will remain a problem for the church until the Lord returns. Whereas I'm not sure that racial conflict will remain a problem because race has not always been around and could well disappear. That makes me very wary about getting too wrapped up in the immediate phenomena of the problem as they face us. I've heard it asked a couple of times, Students have asked, you know, do we need to add a chapter to the Belgian Confession or the Westminster Confession or our church's statement of faith uh, dealing with gay marriage or transgenderism? Uh, I think the danger with that is always you end up in a kind of whack-a-mole situation. Particularly if you do the job properly, it's going to take you many, many years to come up with the right way of putting it. And by the time you've developed that, the problem may have gone away. Or another problem may be far more urgent at that point. My answer has also always been to the students, well, we don't need to add to the Westminster Confession of Faith the chapter on, say, gay marriage, because we have a very clear and powerful positive statement of what marriage is that, by implication, excludes all of the alternatives. 
So we don't have to sit around trying to imagine what combo of marriage is going to come up with next in the world around us and produce something in the confession to deal with it. What we have to do is teach people the truth and then trust that through the Holy Spirit and the regular preaching of the word week by week, they will be wise and virtuous enough to apply that truth to the specific problems that pop up in society around us. That is not to say that it may not be very helpful for denominations to produce papers on particular problems that occur in society. That's a kind of occurs at a lower level, but can be pastorally very useful. And I would recommend uh, to you in this context, um, God bless them, they're a small denomination, I don't know how they do it, but the Reformed Presbyterian uh, Church of, the, you know, of, of North America has produced some excellent papers on sexuality issues over the last 10 years. Very, very helpful. I would recommend that you get hold of them and look at them. Uh, the PCA's paper uh, from a couple of years ago, very helpful. There are papers out there that churches produce drawing on the talent, the ability and the insights they have that can help congregants and pastors navigate the immediate waters. But what we need to do more than anything else is teach people the positive truth of the gospel and positive implications of the gospel so that they can then handle whatever challenge comes their way, be it a national challenge or something that pops up in their neighborhood or their place of employment. The whole counsel of God should be taught. Maybe I, I move in, a, in what some might regard as a heretical direction at this point. But that makes me think that there's probably a good place for thematic preaching today. I know it's unpopular in some quarters to say that. But maybe there's a place for thematic preaching. Best thing you can do from a didactic teaching perspective on marriage and sexuality is teach a series on creation, it seems to me. Teach about man and woman created in the image of God. And I'm not sure that that can be done adequately in one sermon when you happen to be working through the book of Genesis. A series of sermons on that might be very useful, helpful, and appropriate. This is where, of course, the, the abandonment of two services on a Sunday uh, is disastrous because that forces a kind of either-or on you. If you have two services on a Sunday, then you can choose to do your thematic series in one of those uh, uh, services and the uh, consistent exposition in the other one. You don't have that either-or. But even if you just have one service on a Sunday, I think that's something to contemplate. Teach the creeds uh, confessions and the catechisms. Just because a confession is a confession, just because it's approved by the Orthodox Presbyterian Church or the Presbyterian Church in America, does not make it authoritative. But I would say this about history. History is a great solvent. History gets rid of an awful lot of rubbish over time. Um, one of the amusing things about the, the sort of traditional versus contemporary worship debate is often people say, you know, look at the amount of rubbish that's written by... Uh, contemporary Christian hymn writers. And sure, there's an awful lot of rubbish. Uh, go back and look at all the hymns the Wesleys wrote and see what proportion of them are in our hymn books today. Uh, they wrote some rubbish. Uh, they really did. But that's not... I mean, if, if I could write one hymn like And Can It Be, I wouldn't mind writing rubbish for the rest of my life. You know, you've made a great contribution. Reminds me of an interview with uh, Joseph Heller, the author of Catch-22, of course, who had the, the tragedy of writing his greatest book as his first book. And every other book he wrote after that was compared to Catch-22 unfavorably. And somebody once asked him in an interview, uh, sneeringly, you never wrote another book as good as Catch-22, did you? And Heller replied, no, but then neither did anybody else. Which I thought was a great way of, of responding. Time is very corrosive of stuff that maybe speaks very helpfully to the moment, but lacks perennial relevance. Wesley's wrote a hymn on a man uh, to be sung by a man on his way to the gallows. That's a weird thing to think of today. That lacks relevance today. It may have been a great hymn in its day, but it spoke to a practice that has now passed, by and large. Time is a great corroder of rubbish, and that's why I think the creeds and the catechisms are very helpful. They're not the Bible, but they're a pretty good guide to what is useful over time. 
pretty good guide, a good place to start, a good framework to use when we're thinking about these things. So that would be my second point. Uh, first, well, that's my third point, isn't it? First, complicity. Second, historical precedent of the second century pointing us towards the need to be strong communities. Third point, teach the whole counsel of God. Fourth point, shape intuitions through biblical worship. What's interesting, of course, is a lot of what I spoke about in the first lecture points us beyond what I would call typical worldview thinking. I have friends who use the term worldview a lot. I've always had a number of hesitations with it over the years. One, I think there is no Christian worldview. There are various Christian worldviews. Uh, it seems to me that Baptists and Presbyterians probably have significant differences in the way they view the world. Uh, not fellowship-breaking differences, but differences that are significant in the way we imagine the world to be, not least with how we imagine our children to be within that world. The other thing about worldview thinking is it tends to focus very much on, on arguments and self-conscious philosophies. I'm more and more convinced that the way most of us relate to the world most of the time is not on the basis of arguments and thinking back to first principles. It's more intuitive than that. When I leave the lecture today, I'm going to exit through the back door. I did physics to the age of 16. I have no idea why doors work and walls don't for exiting. They just do. I intuit them as, as helpful ways to get out of the building. Uh, we often do that morally as well, don't we? Most of us, if we were asked to defend a moral theory, would, it would come down to, well, really, I, I, I was taught it as a kid. I trusted my parents. I trusted my pastor. And it seems right to me, but I've never actually thought about going back to the real principles. And that's okay. It's the way we are. We imagine the world in a certain way. And if what I was saying in the first lecture this morning is the case, then the big problem with the world today is most people imagine the world's reality in a very sinful sense. It's the imagination that's highly problematic, the intuitions that are highly problematic in this. We need, I think, to have our intuition shaped. How do our intuitions get shaped? Well, not simply by arguments. Not simply by what's said from the pulpit. The whole of the liturgical action of the church service should shape our intuitions. I very much appreciate the church I'm at in Grove City, the OPC congregation there, where the rhythm of the service follows the rhythm of the gospel. A reading of the law, a confession of sin, a declaration of forgiveness. That's important stuff. That's not just uh, uh, prep for the sermon. The rhythm of the service shapes intuitions. That's not to say that's the only way it can be done. I'm not saying you have to do it that way. What I am saying is the worship service as a whole is critical to shaping spiritual intuitions. That's why music is very important. Martin Luther knew this. So was always, you know, Martin Luther, a number of people ask me, why aren't you a Lutheran given the amount you've written on Luther and how you clearly love Luther? To which my answer is always, I wish I could be. Man, if I could just persuade myself on the Lord's Supper, I would be a Lutheran. Nothing would hold me back. Martin Luther, not always the wisest pastoral individual, but Martin Luther decides he needs a vernacular liturgy. He comes to that conviction really in 1520. I believe that's a pretty settled conviction for Luther by 1520. He does not implement a full vernacular liturgy in Wittenberg until 1525. And he gives reasons why. One of them is he's worried that too much change will disturb the people. I always used to use that when I taught at seminary uh, as an example of, you know, take a call to a church, unless it involves heresy, don't change it for five years. A, you need to be, build goodwill to change stuff. 
And B, you don't want to disturb people. The, the game is to get people to where they should be, not to get them to where they should be tomorrow. If it takes Luther five years, it may take you five years to get there. So he doesn't want to disturb the people. But the other reason is fascinating. He can't get the music right. He wants, as he said, I need German music for a German mass. The music has to correlate with the words in an idiom that the German people will understand. Luther there is intuitively articulating what I'm trying to self-consciously articulate now. And that is that, for want of a better term, the aesthetics of worship are important as well. My wife and I met, and uh, I served as an elder in a psalm singing denomination and church in Scotland, and we loved the singing of the psalms. Godless man as he was, by the way, Robert Burns' poem, The Cotter Saturday Night, is the most beautiful poetic description of Sabbath preparation in a humble Presbyterian household you will read anywhere. And at the heart of it lies unaccompanied psalm singing. Every year, I actually, I use this in class, and I'll say to the students, if anybody can tell me what Elgin and Martyrs are, I will give you 5% immediate credit on your overall grade. No student has ever, ever successfully answered that question. Elgin and Martyrs are psalm tunes. And Burns makes a brilliant comment there. He says, you know, go, the psalm tunes are more beautiful than any Italian trills. That's his, his wording. Uh, the tunes are important. Tunes are important. Music is important. The aesthetic experience of worship is important. Not in some idolatrous sense, but in the way that it shapes our intuitions. Music is fascinating. There are only, there are two things that human beings can do that no other creature on the face of the planet can do. One of them is speak. And I don't care how many chimpanzees you teach to order a Coke Zero by pushing around bits of plastic on a table. Hugely impressive as that is, no chimpanzee is ever going to produce even a limerick, let alone one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Only human beings speak. Only we have the brain physiology so to do. And only human beings can produce and hear and appreciate music. I've often wondered, thinking of the Reformation, is there a, an approach to the Reformation that sees the restoration of the centrality of the preached word and of congregational singing as a sort of restoration slash recognition of aspects of the image of God that had been neglected for centuries at that point. Music is powerful. There's a reason why the Psalms lie at the heart of the Bible. When Israel wants to express her deepest agonies of soul, it cannot be done in prose. It cannot merely be done in poetry. It requires the perfect union of poetry and music to do that. And I think we all know music is powerful for good and for ill. Worship is very important, not simply for the information it communicates, not simply because it is the context in which the Lord takes the preached word and applies it to our hearts. It is the context in which, I would say, our imaginative intuitions are shaped by the Holy Spirit. Think about it as well, the Psalms, singing the Psalms, how that speaks to the soul, how that shapes how we imagine our place in the world to be. Next point, I think we need to, I'm not going to call this an apologetic strategy. I'm going to call it a pastoral didactic strategy. I think we need to realize that the rising generation think very differently to us because those terms of recognition in society have changed on so dramatically and specifically in the realms of sex and sexual identity. We need to realize that the rising generation are under peculiar pressure on that in a way that we never were. 
One of the things that I, I've said numerous times, I've talked to churches around the country, is we need to make a vital distinction between the LGBTQ movements as a political lobby group, cultural lobby group, and individuals whose lives are being torn apart by this stuff. We need to be ruthless in our refutation of the former, and we need to be pastorally sensitive in how we handle those who are struggling or suffering under the latter. That doesn't mean we cave to them, but we need to make that distinction. It seems to me too often right and left have a vested interest in conflating those two things. The right, so they don't have to treat with appropriate pastoral care the people for whom this is the sin they're challenged by. The left, because they want to make out that any opposition to LGBTQ ideology simply represents hatred of individuals for whom this is their issue. We need to carefully distinguish those two, and we need to realize, particularly our young people, are faced with a challenge that we never were. We were never faced with the challenge of being a member of the church or a respected member of society. We were able to have our cake and eat it in a way that they were not. We were also able to find private spaces in a way that the social media age does not allow. Privacy has disappeared. All kinds of things, privileges that we enjoyed, our young people do not enjoy. I don't like the term snowflake when applied to young people because I think it trivializes the challenges that young people face today. Even at a basic level, it was much easier for me to get a damn payment on a house than it is for any of the kids in my classes that I teach. The world is a harder place for them in many ways than it was for me. We need to realize this is a peculiar challenge to young people. And that means we need to think about ways of not simply teaching the Bible, but making the Bible persuasive. What do I mean by that? When I first became a Christian and somebody said to me, well, the Bible teaches that homosexuality is wrong, that was an easy sell. Born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s and 80s, went to a boys' school, boys' grammar school, where, you know, homosexuality was despised by the culture, by and large. That was what the upper classes did, if you like, in my world. The Bible's teaching was an easy sell, believing it cost me nothing. It was simply a religious form of the terms of membership of the society to which I belonged. It was easy to find the Bible persuasive on that point. It is not so easy to find that today. One of the things I found with the kids I teach at Grove is they'll ask, they'll come to me, and they're good Christian kids. And the conversation will run something like this. I know the Bible teaches this, and I know that's correct, but I don't understand why. Well, that's a powerful question. Now, one answer is, because God says so. And that's a good answer in some ways. But it's not an entirely persuasive answer. Because I know at the back of their mind, what's going on is the next question is coming up. Well, does God say that simply because he doesn't want my gay friends to be happy? Is God a mean person? Is God just an arbitrary tyrant? I know they're asking that question. And I can thump the Bible at them as long as the day lasts. But as I read recently in a review of another book, you know, to draw lessons from the Bible, sometimes you have to do more than thump it. I found it increasingly helpful to make young people think about, well, let's think about why God may have made this a rule. Let's go to government websites and look at statistics about life expectancy for active gay males. Let's look at the incidence of sexually transmitted diseases. Let's look at some of the neutral sources on this, or sources that would have a vested interest in spinning things in as positive a way as possible. And let's ask ourselves whether these statistics represent human flourishing. I get them to think about their bodies. Is the body designed for this activity? Well. Let's look at the medical evidence and see what damage this does to the human body. Let's look at the 
effects of the impact of the breakdown of family life in the world we live in. I'm always struck by a haunting comment by my friend Rusty Reno, giving a lecture a few years ago on the sexual revolution. He made the comment, he said, the interest payments on the mortgage of the sexual revolution are paid for on the poor streets of Philadelphia. The Hollywood elites that promote this stuff have the money to indulge in the lifestyle. The poor people who follow the lifestyle don't have the money to save them, to save them from the dramatic consequences of their actions. Now, some will say here, but, oh, but aren't you trying to argue on the basis of autonomous human reason for this position? As we're like, well, not at all. Rooting my authority for my, the objection to homosexuality in the authority of the word of God. And then I'm demonstrating to young people that God says this. And you know, it actually makes sense that he says this. I'm not asking students to place their hope and faith in natural arguments. I'm helping them to understand why believing in those biblical arguments is not lunacy. It's not crazy. Guess what? God designed the world with a moral shape. And if you choose to transgress or fight against that moral shape, there are consequences that are not just visible to the eyes of faith. They're visible to anybody who has eyes to see. So I might suggest that you might want to think in your strategy, pastoral strategy, particularly with young people. Teach them about creation. And then show them how contradiction of the moral shape of the world that God has created causes tangible evil effects, does not lead to the happy, flourishing life that the gay pride parades try to present you with every June. Finally, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this again this evening. We should neither despair nor be optimistic. It's very uh, affected by when Todd and I interviewed Rod Dreher, conservative journalist, and uh, I made the comment to Rod that every day at three o'clock when his news blast arrives in my mailbox, you know, everything seemed bright and happy in the day till then. Then I click on Rod's slate of news stories about how we're all going to die by this time next week or <laughs> governments are going to make transgenderism compulsory or something like that. Everything goes downhill at about two minutes past three every day. And I made a comment to him about, you're such a pessimist. And he said, no, I'm not a pessimist, nor am I an optimist. He said, I'm hopeful. There's a difference between optimism and hope. Optimism is just a kind of keep your fingers crossed and everything will turn out right in the end. Don't worry, it's all going to be okay. Bottom line is, individually, it's not going to be okay. We're all going to die. That's going to happen. But hope says that whatever happens to us, whatever suffering that comes our way, individually or corporately, will be subverted for God's greater purposes. That's the hope. I'm very struck again and again by Paul's comment about the light momentary afflictions, or his sufferings being but light momentary afflictions compared to the eternal weight of glory that is to come. That eternal perspective is very important for maintaining hope, not optimism. I am resigned. It was very liberating, actually. About six months ago, I suddenly realized, man, you're in your 50s. Maybe you've got 20 or 30 years left ahead of you. You are going to lose every single battle you fight for the rest of your life. The forces waged against you are just too great. And I resolved to do two things. One, I was reminded of Theoden in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I'm going to lose, but I'm still going to meet him on the field of battle. I'm not going quietly. And secondly, I thought, isn't that liberating? Isn't that liberating? I can fight every battle, and it doesn't matter if I lose, because I'm building, I'm working for something that isn't about me, but is something bigger than me. My wife and I became grandparents for the first time four weeks ago. Uh, it's amazing how you have children, it changes your perspective. You have grandchildren. You know, I'm looking at my granddaughter and thinking, oh man, now I've got to worry about the next 70 years. You know? I've only got to worry about 50 years up until this point. 
Think long term. Hope. Neither hope nor despair. The world in which we live is entering a new, chaotic, uncharted, and I think very dark era. But we shouldn't despair. We should prepare. We should prepare ourselves, be informed. We should know what we believe and why we believe it and why it makes sense. We should worship God in a manner that forms us as true disciples and pilgrims, intellectually and intuitively. And we should keep before our eyes the unbreakable promises that the Lord has made and confirmed in Jesus Christ. This is not a time for hopeless despair nor naive optimism. We should lament the ravages of the fall as they play out in the distinctive way and the dramatic way that our generation has chosen. But we should let that lamentation be the context for sharpening our identity as the people of God and sharpening our hunger for the great consummation that awaits us all at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.